Right, everyone, welcome back. This is the final debate of the morning session. Softwareization and the public cloud. That's what we're going to be debating. Um, our expert witnesses are all on stage, as you can see. Chris and Graham are here as well with Varley, ready to go. I think everyone now is back in the room. Thank you very much. So, softwareization doesn't necessarily mean this, this move to the public cloud. Maybe we do want to go all in the public cloud. Maybe we don't. Maybe we want to continue on our disaggregation efforts and transform into software-based operators, focus on that first. What's the best approach? So much to discuss. Luckily, we have the people to help answer all your questions here with us. So, without further ado, we are going to start and ask our first expert witness. Raj, would you like to take to the lectern? Our first expert witness is Raj Yavutka, who is Chief Technology Officer with Juniper Networks. Please, Raj. Thank you. So let me start by, first of all, identifying the trends that make this debate relevant. Why are we even discussing public clouds? First is virtualization. Telco infrastructure is getting virtualized. And who better than public clouds to provide virtualized infrastructure because they were born in virtualization, right? They provide uh, really uh, scalable, uh, highly available uh, virtualized infrastructure. Second trend is cloudification. With 5G especially, metro access, core networks, edge networks are getting highly distributed because you have lots of aggregation points. So you have hundreds of mini edge clouds, some of them as small as half a rack of servers. They act as aggregation points and service providing points. When you get such a distributed cloudified architecture, you need to automate lifecycle management and operations of that. And public cloud providers are experts in that. The th third uh, particular trend is disaggregation. With CUPS, control plane is separated from uh, a data plane. Control plane can be uh, centralized, so you can place it in a uh, public cloud. If you do that, you get advantages of the virtualized infrastructure at scale they provide, consumption-based, agile, and highly available. So that makes it attractive to move to the public cloud. And fourth is what I call telco bypass. Traditionally, when we looked at connecting from enterprises to public cloud, you went to the telco pop, and telco pops had connectivity to AWS or GCP or Azure using direct connect. But more and more, public cloud providers are creating their own local zones. They have 100 local zones or more. One of them claims to have close to 200 local zones. They're coming closer to enterprises. They're providing connectivity from local zones to the public cloud. And they're offering that to the enterprises by also having an on-prem edge cloud, bypassing the telcos completely. That's a threat to telcos. So those are the four trends that make this debate highly relevant. What can telcos do about it? I believe that there are three E's that they should adopt. E as in embrace, extend, and exploit. Embrace the public cloud where it makes sense. Move the IT workloads there. Makes no perfect sense, right? You get advantages of not having to deal with uh, IT infrastructure on telco clouds. You can also move control plane workloads, provided you can do cost management and don't get locked into one public cloud. That is Empress. Extend. Now, telcos are known for connectivity. Their expertise is connectivity. If you go to the public clouds, they provide basic IP connectivity. Nothing like carrier grade networking. At the same time, most of the enterprises are going to be multiple clouds. They're going to multiple public clouds. So you can provide connectivity as a service on top of public clouds using regional network providers, which provide, allow you to provide quality of service and other things. And lastly, exploit. To the last uh, panel point, you can start offering services at edge, which are monetizable using 5G slicing and so on. Why not give a slice per user, per app? To Constantine's point, you can have Constantine network, Francisca network, anywhere in the globally available. Those are the opportunities. Thank you. Raj, thank you very much. Excellent, thank you. So, our next speaker, Ahmed, let's come to, to the lectern. Our next um, expert witness is Ahmed El Syed, who is CIO and Europe Digital Engineering Director at Vodafone UK. Thank you. Good to have you. Everyone. The lectern is yours. I think, I think my colleague has covered the different trends. I'm, I'm a software developer by passion, by experience. So, I want to talk first from a customer point of view. What, what does customer really need, right? I always see that speed is the new money. Customers are looking for someone that can really satisfy their needs on the right time. So can you build the right product at the right time? 
I have been in the telecom industry for, for, for long, and also probably many people of you guys also may be coming from other industries. One of the biggest mistakes we did on the telecom is that we were super slow to respond to the fact that many startups, many companies out there are looking for infrastructure as code, right? This is the mistake. We had data centers. Banks has data centers before even Amazon exists or before Google or the others were there. But we did the mistake that we didn't respond fast enough to have this ready for monetization out there. And that's what these guys had uh, make use of. So that's, that's the core thing I think we need to learn from this. Okay. Sorry, I have any problem. Would you mind if I sit for this two minutes? Yeah, please do. Thank you so much. I had a, a knee injury just for playing football. It's not always easy. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, so, so that, that was the core sense of, uh, of the problem I think that we have faced. Then comes the question of, so why, why should we move to cloud, right? I think it's not the cloud by itself. Cloud is, is the infrastructure at the end. It's the transformation to get there. So if we want to solve the problem we created before, that we were not fast enough, then we need to think how to be quick, since customer wants us to respond quickly, how to provide a service that's fully stable to our customers so that they can trust us on this service, and then how to provide it in a cheap manner, since, as you know, with the whole inflation and everything, it's becoming tough uh, for everyone all around us. If you take this to the cloud discussion in general, and again, we'll have the debate, hopefully it will be a healthy one, but if you get this to the cloud uh, discussion, irrelevant whether it's public cloud or pri private cloud, then let's take these three subjects into there. What cloud can help us with, again, whether private or public, is that you build what we call cloud native on a microservices architecture, so that when you have to respond to a customer need, you can spin up more teams that can work on different pieces of code, and then they can deliver the value quicker to a customer, right? So that's the core part of what we call cloud native, irrelevant where you host it. The second thing is that you need your service to be stable. For the telecoms, for example, iPhone launch is a super big thing. I mean, I have been in Hungary and Kenya and Egypt before, which was slightly much lower ARPU countries, so iPhone launch was not that big in the other industries. But for us here, iPhone Lite is like, it's like the Christmas sales. It's super high sales that happens, right? If you, if you have to scale before the night your infrastructure like 10 times or something to cover for it, it's super expensive. But the best option for you is that you go to the night with the minimum infrastructure. As the traffic comes in, the infrastructure scales it out, and then you can cover all the customer needs again. And when the traffic goes down, then you go down again, and then you save money, and you give uh, the perfect experience. The last part is the unitary cost. How, how I can deliver this on the best unitary cost? And then if you map this again to a software engineer, it's all about productivity. How can I deliver more for the same time? since the most important asset today is actually the software engineering time. So if you put the three together, you find that the concept of cloud transformation can get us to what we need. And then the question that probably we'll answer on the discussion is whether we do it through the public cloud or a private cloud. I think that's the secondary question to ask after you understand exactly what customer needs. Thank you so much. Ahmed, thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for that. Well, our next expert witness is Azar Saeed. Azar, please. Azar is a Senior Director, TME Technology and Strategy at Red Hat. Thank you, Guy. Um, I think the debate here is not about whether we are going to move our applications to cloud. The debate here is about whether we are going to move our applications, all of them lock, stock, and barrel to public cloud. And if you actually take a slightly narrower view from that point, the answer is no, not everything will move to public cloud. In fact, uh, there have been some recent studies where people have actually repatriated their workload back. The word they use is repatriation of workloads back from public cloud into their private environment for various reasons. Let's examine some of those reasons in terms of why that's happening and how we can mitigate in those um, you know, circumstances or situations. Now, people are repatriating the workloads because of cost shocks. They're repatriating they're because of data sovereignty issues or new rules that are coming up by different governments across uh, the entire world. Um, by, you know, a, a need to have operations control over what they manage and what they run. And, of course, they are also realizing that not all SLAs can be met with the public cloud. And I think um, previous panelists actually spoke a little bit about the SLA um, availability in terms of the public cloud. And if you know that today a public cloud SLA is about 99.95, I don't know if that's sufficient enough uh, unless you actually actively design an infrastructure 
to, uh, to take care of that and actually provide a better availability in that sense. And then the workload types that, is, that do require hardware acceleration, that do require certain capabilities because not everything can be completely done in software just yet. Maybe we'll get there. We'll get to a point in the future that we will be driven everything in 100% software without no hardware acceleration needed. I don't think we're there yet. So for those reasons, there is a lot of movement of applications both ways. Some applications are moving, which do not need these type of capabilities into the public cloud, and others are actually moving back from the public cloud into a private environment. Now, with that said, what are you know, what should a telco or an operator do in this particular context and how do they do it? Now, there are some ways to mitigate certain this, this situation or these circumstances. One, um, you know that public cloud providers allow you to upload very easily, but they charge you an arm and a leg when you download them, right? So the costs are different and especially we have seen actually operators, uh, one of the operators, I believe they saved about, you know, 80% or 60% in terms of just moving the applications back into the private environment. So what you could do is actually build an abstraction layer. Build an abstraction layer between those public and private environments that allow you to actually make application portability easy. And then take those applications and move them up, burst them into the public cloud when you need it, when you need that capacity, or pull them back when you don't need it, thereby actually optimizing your operating environment. Thank you. Azar, thank you very much. Lovely, thank you. Well, um, our next expert witness isn't with us in the room, wasn't able to travel today. We're just going to play a little video. Don't, we're just going to play a video because one of our regular contributors, um, Beth Cohen, SDN Product Strategies at Verizon, wasn't able to join us um, but did want to contribute to this debate. So first of all, let's quickly hear what Beth has to say. We are actively looking at... Um, public cloud and to see if there is a uh, reason to move to public cloud or at least part of our services to public cloud. Uh, you know, obviously the, the biggest uh, components would be uh, cost, you know, total cost of ownership and greater flexibility, uh, elasticity um, to help with uh, load balancing over, over time, you know, uh, during peak you know, to carry peak loads. Those are those are some of the things that we think about when we are considering, uh, you know, a public cloud strategy. Uh, do I think that the public cloud is going to take over everything? The answer is no. Um, however, you know, it it makes good sense to at least take over part or at least some of the services that we provide today, or rather, some of the infrastructure that we provide today when we built our 5G network, it is completely on the cloud. Um, you know, so we're moving, we've been moving away for the last five or six years from a, uh, you know, a, a hardware-based solution and it's really sort of, you know, disaggregated, cloud, cloudified, the applications are cloudified. Uh, but there are things holding us back. Uh, you know, one of them is the network services, um, you know, are not, um, cloud native for the most part. Uh, some of them are, but uh, many, many of the hardcore routing and, and, you know, those and the RAN pieces are not um, cloud native as of yet. Um, so I would say it's more of a process and the public cloud is just one aspect of that process uh, for cloudifying our, our infrastructure. The real question is, how do we disaggregate the hardware and the software? How do we, um, how do we cloudify and, and create cloud native applications? How do we work with our vendors to create cloud uh, native applications? Uh, you know, how do we develop the, the infrastructure that can support the elastic workloads and the new technology to support our 5G networks um, and our you know, demand for network as a service? All of those components are incorporated into our strategy and, uh, you know, using the public cloud is just one small piece. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thanks to Beth for, for those contributions. Right, back to the room. Manish, please, sorry about the confusion there. Coming up to the lectern, um, Manish Singh is the CTO of Telecom Systems Business at Dell Technologies. Manish. 
All right, thank you, Guy. So, yes, I think so too. I think we had two great debates uh, in the morning uh, before this one, uh, and now we're talking about cloud. Uh, the, what I was noticing was, I think we are we, we take, make, trying to get into these discussions in a bit of a siloed manner. Why should we disaggregate? Why should we do open RAN? Uh, are the service providers going to become digital service providers? Uh, and now we're talking about move to the cloud. I think there's an opportunity to bring all these things together and take a more holistic view of what the trends are and where things are moving. My view is the future of the infrastructure is going to be hybrid, distributed, multi-cloud. Now, there's a role for the public clouds to play in there. For sure, there were some things we talked about, IT enterprise applications, maybe BSS, OSS, those kind of functions uh, can be uh, deployed into a public cloud. When it comes to networks, networks by nature are distributed and hierarchical. And there are certain performance requirements that the operators have to deliver. Five nines, latency, throughput, et cetera, that have been talked about. And that requires a distributed infrastructure. Now it has been talked about, you know, centralize all you can, distribute what you must. I think the opportunity in front of us is to really look at and think about centralize probably what can be monetized. And you can improve your TCO if it can. Distribute what can be monetized. And here, I want to get back to the distributed nature of the telecom infrastructure. The outside plans that the telcos have, telcos today manage them, deploy them, and uh, uh, continue to operate them. As we start to look at where things are headed, especially with edge, what will edge require? A distributed infrastructure that's going to be deployed that has to be managed and operationalized in a cost-efficient manner. And I think telcos are very well positioned to be the engine room for that edge. This is where I want to go back to the second panel, which was around Open RAN. Open RAN is a piece in that puzzle of how do you start to softwareize, disaggregate the infrastructure, and start to arrive at an infrastructure where you can bring in RAN workloads, but you can also start to think, think about bringing in some of the edge workloads. One thing about edge I want to mention is, you know, especially with the cost of compute, storage, and, and sensors going down, more and more data is getting created. Enterprise applications are going to continue to improve and innovate, and these applications are going to consume and analyze the data more closer to where it is getting generated. I think that's a perfect opportunity from a monetization perspective. Last thing I want to say is around how we get there. Disaggregation, which was talked about, that to me is a key piece in the puzzle, whether you're talking about from a core perspective and disaggregate the core, which to a large extent is already getting done, or whether you start to disaggregate on the radio access side from an open RAN perspective and start to deploy it on a more homogenized distributed infrastructure where you can bring in RAN workloads, but other workloads as well. Thank you. Thank you, Manish. Thank you. Thanks, Manish. Just proving there how interconnected these debates really are. Um, our next expert witness is Chris Viduris, who is CTIO at NEOS Networks. Chris, please come up. Yeah, thanks, Guy. I just uh, wanted to start by saying, uh, you know, a lot of telecom operators that are not new to cloud. Uh, I mean, cloud has been obviously the last 12, 15 years. Uh, sort of going on in terms of the cloud journey and what operators are doing. Even going back to my own experience, uh, I mean, seven, eight years ago, I used to work for one of the large continental operators. And even at that time, we started looking at private cloud, putting in OpenStack. And as soon as you sort of do that replacement, you know, in the infrastructure side, moving more into a, a sort of cloud environment, you start thinking of shall I re-engineer my applications, shall I go cloud native, looking into Docker, Kubernetes. The question always was how we link back to the business benefit, speed to market, agility, the ability to bring new applications and mobile apps and new digital experience to our customers, right? Uh, in more uh, recent times, in my recent role at NEOS, uh, we're just completing a large technology refresh Public cloud, I would say, play a large part of it. 
If you are more in the IT domain, look at things like ERP, HR systems, you're naturally inclined to go public cloud for that. On the digital side, your portals, data and analytics increasingly moving into public cloud. I think the domain which is obviously hard to penetrate is around the OSS, most of it is on-prem. Obviously, this doesn't mean uh, cloud native approaches have not been developed. Uh, if you like, even at the orchestration level, a lot of the software now is like cloud native running on private cloud. So there's a lot of progress there. I mean, in terms of, you know, uh, how do you plan this journey? And uh, I think in the early years was like a replacement. Let's move from infrastructure into sort of more of a cloud approach. Uh, and then it was more like, can I uh, become more cloud native, right? Can I re-engineer my applications, re-architect, refactor, replace, uh, go to SaaS? So I think it's important to have that sort of journey mapped out. Uh, my personal approach is to think about cloud strategy. How do I start from a cloud strategy? Look at my workloads uh, one by one, create like an inventory, look at sort of performance requirements, security requirements. Uh, and, and then make decisions workload by workload. I would say uh, this is not free of challenges. The more you go into multi-cloud, distributed cloud, complexity increases. You have hybrid, hybrid IT, hybrid cloud. So that's one area. Obviously, security as well. I think cloud make uh, great strides during the pandemic. A lot of people see the scale. They started to uh, trust uh, cloud vendors more. It doesn't mean all the vendors are equally secure, but obviously security is of feeling towards public cloud is improving, as well as skills like embedding DevOps within the organization, uh, looking at sort of governance, tool chains. So, so I think there's a lot of challenges, and obviously, especially telcos, they need to attract more talent to uh, work on these challenges. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Excellent. Um, on with the show, and our final expert witness is Daniel Royston, who is CEO and founder of Telco DR. So um, I think it's Daniel over there. Please I come up to the lectern. I brought props. You have. <laughs> <laughs> here you go. I'm going to just put this right here. <coughs> a little bag. Thanks, Guy. No what? No animals. No, <laughs> no animals. In that bag. No animals. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, watch out. <laughs> So thanks, Guy. I'm so excited to be here at the Great Telco Debate. Uh, I'm Danielle Royston. I'm the CEO and founder of Telco DR. Everyone knows me as DR, Telco's public cloud evangelist. But really, I'm a software girl at heart. I have a computer science degree from Stanford University in California. I've programmed computers my entire life. I've sold software for years. Since 2009, I've been the CEO of 25 different uh, enterprise software companies, including the coolest new telco software company, Tatogi. I guess you could say, I love software. I do. In 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal where he said, software is eating the world. He realized that software is more flexible than hardware. It can be easily customized to meet changing needs. It is more cost effective than hardware. And because software can perform the same functions as hardware, it has disrupted traditional hardware industries and has led to the rise of software services. For example, look at my iPhone that's practically perfect in every way. Every day, there are new apps, bug fixes, and features delivered instantly. It just keeps getting better. Just think of all the hardware that this device has consumed. Let's see in my little bag. So the easy one, right, is the little alarm clock. We now are selecting our own chimes to jolt us awake in the morning. Very fun, right? Remember the calculator you used to have on your desk? No longer, it's in your pocket. Right, this will make some of you sad. The landline telephone. <laughs> Hello, Ray. When's lunch? I'm starving. Right? But don't forget, we used to walk around with cassette players, where they played 10 songs at a time. Now, in our, in our phone, we can access any song we want at any time. It's ridiculous. And last but not least, if we weren't sad for telcos, be sad for the digital 
the digital camera people who say cheese. <laughs> cheese, right? This thing has now gone away and it's now consumed by, by our phone. Mary Poppins used to carry all these things around, but you don't have to. Telco just needs more software. Imagine the CapEx and OpEx cost reduction of network equipment by maximizing software. Mark Andreessen was right. Software is eating the world, and it's coming for your network. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you can leave the phone. You can leave the, leave the, honestly, leave the phone. I'll, I'll take that with me. You want to keep yeah, the, we'll, we'll talk my, later. Pink, talk later. my pink princess phone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> the hotline to Ray. Oh, Daniel, thanks very much indeed. That's great. I'm out of here. Yeah, let's go fly, Kate. Okay. <laughs> oh, follow that. <laughs> right, after that, I think we need follow that. a motion. We've got one. Have you got props as well? We've got one. You've got a here motion. It is. Here okay, it is. Graham Here's the motion. is about to reveal the motion. Here's the motion. The motion is public cloud is the simplest route. Public cloud is the simplest route to radical transformation of the world's telcos. That's the motion guy. And Chris will be speaking for the motion. Ladies and gentlemen, the, the notion of public cloud has, has terrified many, many elements of the, of the telecom industry for, for a long time. It's sort of an us and them. It's the, they're, they're completely radical, they're global, their power is enormous. But look at the motion and look at it in detail. So it's the simplest route to radical transformation for the world's telcos. I think all too often we get, a, we get too obsessed with many of the larger telcos represented in this room today and often in, on industry platforms. But think of the way that cloud can be applied to help get over those hurdles of, of moving towards the, the cloud dream that, that we're all aiming for or, the, or the, the new generation of telco. The cloud providers aren't just one uniform bunch. They all come to, to the market with different skill sets. They're gradually building other skill sets as well. But think of it from the point of view of, yes, from getting that customer experience, from getting access to the customer, bringing together all the pieces which we've touched upon in both the open round and the opening debates, that it, the world's future is not just about communications, it's about storage, it's about connect, it's about security, and it's compute. So bringing all those things together. The cloud route is the simplest route to bring those things together. And not only for, those, for the larger telcos, who may have some of the in-house resource to be able to deliver that, but think of the literally hundreds of other telcos who might address a, somewhat of a niche market. The ability to take you know, a data and AI solution from one of the cloud providers to perhaps move the network of some of its elements from another cloud provider, and then to use some of the applications delivered from third party. So we should not look at this as being one, sim one simple issue, but dare I say a smorgasbord of offerings which can be dipped into and tasted and tried. We need to try this. We need to be radical. We need the cloud public route. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Wright, ladies and gentlemen. I urge you to vote against the motion, against the motion. So, to, to illustrate why I think you should vote against the motion, I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, the other day, I was in a very fashionable pub in East London, which is very trendy, with my grown-up daughter, who's 24, and we're sitting at a table, and a guy comes around, and he just drops a business card on the table. And all it's got on the business card is his name and his phone number. And he's going around all the tables, dropping a card on with his name and his phone number. So I said to my daughter, well, what's that about? And she goes, oh, he's a drug dealer, right? <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and so you just phone the number and, and he'll be here in like five well, minutes with, that. You with, didn't know with that. whatever you want. Right? <laughs> I'm like, wow, how cool is that, right? How cool is that? Like, when I was her age, it was really hard to get drugs, right? You had to... <laughs> you had to go to, like, dangerous places, right? Oh. Now you just call this number and the guy comes to you, right? <clears throat> how cool is that? The problem with it is, right, it's okay on a Saturday night if you want to snort some coke in the toilet, right, but if you end up depending on this guy, it's going to ruin your life. It's going to cost you a fortune and ruin your life. Come right? on, where's it going? Come on, where are you going? Now, going? public cloud is a bit like that, isn't it?
it's great when you start, right? It's cheap, okay, you can have a little bit of it, it's okay, right? But if you're a big telco, if you're EE or BT or whatever, it's going to ruin your life, right? It's going to be so expensive. It's going to be so expensive you can never afford it, right? Also, SLAs, oh, we heard from Neil, uh, uh, I don't know where he is but in the room, but we heard from Neil, there he is, about the SLAs that, that BT needs to keep to. And obviously, many, many telcos around the world need to do that. Public cloud vendors don't meet those SLAs by and large. Okay, so if you're relying on life and death services, nine nine, you know, one one two nine 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 services, you know, do you want all of that in the public cloud? Probably not. Probably not. So I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to vote against the motion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. As ever. <laughs> yep. Very surprised you didn't go for the let's go fly a kite angle. <laughs> yeah. I, the, yeah, to keep I beat him to it, Chris. I, 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 I was. Are oh, you I about to do that? Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry, Graham. Yeah. <laughs> There's a few more Mary Poppins yeah, I'm sure. uh, stories I'm sure. we get. Um, so, uh, you, are you with Chris's smorgasbord or Graham's uh, Walk on the Wild Side? So, we'll, we'll, we'll <laughs> hold that thought for a moment. I'm going to run away and leave it all to Ray. Ray. <laughs> Hold on one second. Yeah, I know I left my card on the table just with my name and number, but I'm busy right now. Okay, I'll call you back. Okay. Sorry about that, sorry about that. Okay, public cloud. Is it the simpler, simplest route to radical transformation for the telcos? There must be a million questions in the room. Who is going to wave their hand first? We're, okay, we have a question at the back there. Even though I can see who it is, please yes. state your yes. name and your Francesca job Francesca Vodafone UK. Uh, it's not, I don't have a question, but just a few observations. I think it would be great if we could separate this uh, discussion in two. One is how public cloud can enable and help with our digital agenda, helping delivering the data strategy, creating data pipeline, an ETL capability where we can harmonize, create a data scheme and break the data silo and enable collaboration. And then the other one is how can we work together to enable the digital agenda of enterprise? And I think their synergy are, are necessary. We need to bundle the distributed cloud platform uh, with 5G private network, MPN, so that we could help enterprise to become real-time data-driven enterprise. And with our network, we can really we can position ourselves as a, an intelligent fabric that helps carrying those data into the required platform, whether this is an AR VR platform or an AI platform. So having a, a network which is edge-centric, because we're going towards hybrid uh, architecture and distributed workload, and which is cloud native, it's, it's essential. But I think synergy is key in this, uh, in, in this opportunity. Okay. so. I? Yes, absolutely, sure. So I think um, uh, I want to make a couple of observations since you said that. One is that the claim that public clouds will not be able to provide five nines is completely false. It's like any technology disruption. It gets better every day. I worked at Google Cloud. I can tell you that they're going to invest more and more to improve their infrastructure. They're already coming closer to the enterprises to local zones and taking away services from telcos. Second one, like Manish said, is going to be hybrid multi-cloud. And that's where the opportunity for telcos is to make sure that they are good at what they're good at is connectivity. Provide connectivity as a service, use your regional networks to provide connectivity between regions, between clouds, inter-VPC, because public clouds are not focused on providing that kind of, because this goes across the public clouds and on-prem. So that is an opportunity uh, to focus on. And thirdly, I think Neil said, a lot of the telcos cannot make their uh, stock prices go up. They're spending a lot of money on infrastructure, but they can monetize it. If they can embrace part of the public cloud where it makes sense for IT infrastructure, for control plane workloads provided you do cost management, you can win-win here. I, I think that's what the point is missing. And Chris is missing, missing that except, uh, except for his drug dealing story. <laughs> yeah. So, if any, unless anybody wants to come back on this, we've got a, a, the, the next question uh, at, the, at the back there. Yeah. 
Yeah, just come across that. There we go. Thank you. Uh, Mark Gilmore, uh, CTO at uh, Connectivity. Um, so my, my, my question is, is if you move to the kind of the multi-cloud environment, does that then kind of break down the, the premise of the motion, i.e. the simplicity to then bring, to, to come towards um, radical transformation? Because essentially then we come into the same argument as we had earlier on today with Open RAN, that as soon as you move into that sort of environment, you then got to bring a, an integrator of some description to it. And in the Open RAN piece, we ended up with, we essentially end up with a kind of, if you think of it, a, a building blocks, Lego blocks, what you've actually got is somebody that puts together a Lego kit to make it look like your, your Star Wars toy or whatever it is. You know, the, all the pieces are kind of put together. So do we end up losing some of that simplicity because you need to go multi-cloud in order to get resilience, in order to get the SLA, in order to get the security? Okay. Or not. You're shaking your head, but I'm unconvinced. We'll start with Manish, and then we'll come to uh, Azar and Chris. So, Manish. Right, thanks, Guy. I think uh, I'll, I'll no, to, to address your question and actually even the previous comment by Francesca, here, here's some points to think about. Number one, when we think about from an infrastructure perspective, I want to make one statement, right? I mean, telco business is physics-led. Cloud business is software-led. It doesn't matter how elastic or scalable the software is, software cannot trump physics. I.e., when it comes to carrier SLAs, latency, throughput, et cetera, five nines, et cetera, et cetera, that's where the magical opportunity lies in, number one. Number two, I do believe telcos are probably best positioned to manage a distributed cloud infrastructure. Think about it. Today, they are the ones who manage the most effectively a distributed network infrastructure. And they have capabilities, whether it comes from site reliability engineering to capacity planning and on and on. Those capabilities are acquired. Now, let's go back to the cloud. Capabilities around infrastructure as a code, DevSecOps, CI, CD, there are those capabilities. And the opportunity again here is to bring these two together to enable these distributed edge clouds for enterprise applications. A couple of key things. Enterprises themselves are going through massive digital transformation. As I said, cost of compute, storage, sensors continue to go down. Data is getting created at an exponential rate, and this data needs to be analyzed and made actionable. That's where the edge opportunity starts to come in. And from an open RAN perspective, you can have all of these discussions in siloed of where is the TCO for open RAN, where is the, the opportunity for digital transformation. It actually requires to take a holistic view to say, if I softwareize, containerize my infrastructure, workloads running on those infrastructure, and I efficiently manage them, then I can optimize my TCO, and I can maximize my profitability. Yep. And I think that, that that's, that, that's the needle that needs I, to be. I think Mark was asking, though, if, if you take that approach and have, as you mentioned earlier, hybrid distributed multi-cloud, does that become so complex that actually you move away from, from having the simplest route to transformation? Uh, my answer is no, but uh, uh, I know is there okay. a <laughs> yeah. uh, Look, there is um, a notion that hybrid cloud is far more complex than a single cloud, my, or, or multi-cloud is more complex than single cloud. The answer is yes, multi-cloud can be more complex or hybrid cloud can be more complex if you don't have the right capabilities or right policies or right you know, operational uh, environment. Yes, it can be. There are ways to make, simplify that. Now, true, when you take an application and port it over to an AWS API set, that's very different from running that same application in a Google environment because the API set is different, the operational environment is different. So, can, running in a multi-cloud environment in that particular sense and actually running it natively in that particular in those cloud environments is going to be more complex inherently. However, you can actually create some abstraction models that allow you to make your application 
and use some abstraction layers across those cloud environments. When you do that, then you actually run that application in exactly the same way as you'd run in a private cloud. Then portability becomes easy. Management becomes easy. Automation model becomes easy. And when you have that one automation model across those three different cloud environments, then you don't care. Then it, be, then it is as easy as literally deploying an app, an app on a quote unquote server. Doesn't matter where that server lives. Okay. Kill it. So we'll come to Chris and then we can come back to Manish. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, uh, if you look at the sort of uh, multi cloud, uh, I, I mean, my notion of the premise is like you, you want really to get Talco in a box, right? And you go to a hyperscale and say, look, I want Talco in a box, I want BSS, OSS run, all of it running uh, on public cloud. That's not practical, doesn't exist today. So in a way, you have to have your own private cloud, you have to go to public cloud, you have to have a number of components, right? Now, the other sort of obviously uh, desirable thing is to look at multi-cloud and say, look, this looks a bit like SD1, right? These people are the underlay, so I can go to Amazon, to Google, and, and, and I need some sort of layer on top of it to orchestrate this multi-cloud. That layer does not exist today and probably will take a few years to develop. So what you are left with, you are left with orchestrating your workloads on private, and, and that's where sort of telcos uh, are probably will get good at it. Let's talk offline. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, Manish, then Ahmed, then uh, Daniel. Yeah, and I'll keep Everyone. this really short, 30 seconds maybe. You know, the, the, not just the here and now, take a little longer term view of where things are going. Kubernetes is democratizing cloud. The promise of portability of containerized applications on a containerized infrastructure is going to start to simplify a lot of these. I get it. We don't have containerized network functions yet. We're still on our journey to go there. But if we start to take that view, this starts to address that multi-cloud view and, and simplification of that, Kubernetes is going to play a key role in there. OK, I'm at. I, th I think it's a, it's a great question. Well, my view that we're trying to answer from, if you allow me to, from, from, a, from a wrong angle to some extent, right? So you're fully right at that. Um, I always say in, in IT, when usually in corporates, when you have a problem with people, you put an extra governance meeting. When you have a problem in IT, you add an extra IT layer, right? And we keep on building layers over layers over layers, and then you start losing cost, you start losing on reliability and everything. When you look at what Facebook have done over the years, they found that actually the hardware they buy for their data centers, they only need 30, 40% of the components within this hardware to serve a social media kind of, uh, of platform. And then they started to build their own infrastructure. And then they found that you can easily just by designing your own hardware, then you get 40, 50% less cost. And at the same time, also simplicity, since you have less things that, that can fall down and then you can give you even better stability. And I think that's the core problem that us as telecoms have always done that mistake, that we're always looking for someone to solve the problem on top. So we have AWS or the hyperscalers building the public cloud, and then you go locally, you will get your infrastructure from any company, HP, Dell, whatever you name it, and then you get the virtualization layer from another company, and then you're looking for a third company now to put on top a software that can orchestrate it across. I think the answer to your question is that we need to reach a state where we can build these layers so that you own the code that can do the infrastructure across, and then you need the right software team, and that's why one of the big solutions to this problem is that telcos start to heavily, they started already, but they need to run as fast as possible to hire software developers, since you need to reach a state where you're really, really building a proper microservices architecture that you can have fully independent services running, fully containerized, running as images, and then this shift can be super easy. Outside of Vodafone, I have a couple of, uh, of startups and one of the things you get from the hyperscalers is when you're a startup, you get this program at the beginning where you get free credits somehow. And then actually startups can kind of compete across them. So you can start on AWS, and then you go to Microsoft and say, Microsoft, I have been running on AWS. I'm happy to transfer to, to your <coughs> kind of uh, Azure platform. But you give me free credits. And then you can do the same as well with Google. So some of the startups can end up being running for three, four years, almost free on, on the cloud, just by using the free programs of the different operators. To enable this on the startups, the only possibility is that we build the code in a way that it's 100% portable. I can move from any cloud to another, even to a local data center, in maximum three hours. And I can do it in, in, in a seamless way. 
So I think the question is the right one. The challenge that we're trying to answer it with our old ways of working by buying extra layers, I think the solution will lie in the time that we start building these things and having our own infrastructure. We cannot treat orchestrator as, 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 as a traditional or an infrastructure that we don't care about. It becomes part of the value stream as we go through the journey now. It's, it's not like, like how we used to do it before. That's, that's my view. Okay, Dania. Yeah, so I think uh, it's really easy to say uh, we're gonna use multi-cloud and it's, it's quite another thing to do it. Um, I always tell people, take the workload that you have successfully running in some region of whatever public cloud that you're on and then port it to another region of the same cloud and you will learn how operationally difficult that is. Now, porting that same workload to another, um, another public cloud you're right, you have to learn all the APIs. It's op, you know, the operational details are different. And so ask yourself, do you have the team that can pull that off operationally? It's complex. Maybe if you're the biggest telcos, Vodafone, BT, AT&T, you can do something like that. But if you're a smaller telco, uh, I would think twice before doing that. So, so that's number one. And then the other thing I want to address is this idea that's floating around in our industry about building for repatriation and building for cloud agnosticity. Perfect. Um, the entire reason you're going to move it to the public cloud is not because they're running a data center better than you. You're going to move it there because they've built custom chips that are, save you 72% on power consumption. Right? In September, NTT Docomo did their 5G core uh, with AWS and proved that they could save 72% on power consumption. But they had to use Graviton chips. That's only available on AWS. You can't move that to on-prem, you can't move that to Google. Google has their chip. So the whole reason to use the public cloud is to use the stuff that's only available in the public cloud. And so you're gonna have to get comfortable with vendor lock-in. You're gonna have to be comfortable with they, they got you and if they increase prices, they increase prices. But <laughs> I sort of did that. Um, <laughs> but you know the whole idea is that's why you're using the public cloud. I would not move houses and never unpack the boxes because I was just planning to move out again. I'd move in, and live in the house, and use it, and use it the right way. Okay, Chris, and then we'll come to Neil. Yeah, I just Chris. wanted to say something about portability. I mean, everyone remembers Java, right? Program once, debug everywhere type of thing, right? I mean, it's never going to happen. yeah, and, and if you look at so far, most of the people implementing in hyperscalers, obviously they use the not native features of these platforms, right? So portability becomes it becomes hard, you need to re-engineer, That's why abstraction is a key. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, and, and I think if, if you look at so the long run, I think that, that will still stay the case. People will keep using the native sort of, uh, sort of features and will be make it portability difficult, I would say, yeah. Okay, we're gonna come to Raj quickly just to follow up on okay. something and then we'll come to So I think we are moving far away from the premise of the uh, debate itself. It is about the radical transformation of the telcos, which has two parts in my opinion. Whether they radically transform their business model so that they can play a role in a multi-cloud world when enterprises are deciding to be multi-cloud, not telcos. Enterprise workloads are going to Microsoft for some reason because Office versus SAP or Oracle going to AWS. That's the multi-cloud world and opportunity for a telcos is to become the connectivity service provider. That they always done, physical connectivity. Now they get to provide multi-cloud, multi hybrid cloud connectivity. The second part of the radical transformation is whether telcos start embracing public cloud infrastructure and extend it for their own use so that they can reduce their costs. They cannot monetize their services today. Yeah, I, yeah, I, mean, I think Raj's point about going back to the debate is key, right? So I move everything to the cloud. Does it help me turn off? the dozens of complex legacy products that I've got? No. Does it help me turn off 3G? No. Does it help me turn off 2G? No. Does it help me stop offering ADSL in the Channel Islands? No. Um, those are the things that make our world complex. It's not the infrastructure. That's t if, if it was that, um, you know, this, we would have solved this years ago. Um, it's how do, we, how do we move to a world as telcos where we have the iPhone model, where Apple, unsurprisingly, don't support iPhone 4, but we still support ADSL, which is three years, th sorry, three times as old as iPhone 4. That's what we've got to fix to radically reduce the complexity. Um, what is staggering about this debate, though, is, is the previous debate in Open RAN was about lock-in 
and choice. So you want to move all of your business to the three slightly scary, massive organizations and be locked into them forever. And, and Daniela's point is a really, really important one. You will lose out if you do that thinking you can just move around. Yes, you can. there's some elements of, of um, aggregation that you can do to, to be able to do that, but we're in Google Cloud not because we want to move out of it. We're in Google Cloud because we believe they are the best at running data and data analytics. Why would we think to put that, put that in Google Cloud to then move it if we don't think they're good enough? So these, I, I feel we're kind of, on the one hand, no, we can't vendor lock in. On the other hand, we can't have vendor lock in. We want it to be open so everyone can play a part in it. Yet in this space, we're not. And then finally, um, the cloud is like 10 years old. It is, it is kind of earliest viewpoint. Um, our industry is a lot older. Do we genuinely think there's only going to be three or four cloud providers in the world forever? Or do we think there'll be some specialization? Might there be a, a, a telco public cloud specifically? Might there be one for automotive? Um, the, the softwareization, there's a paper that MIT put out that I'll happily share with everyone that's showing actually how hard it is to increase um, you know, the, the, the extra power in a CPU to make your really badly written Python script run. Right? That is becoming a massive issue for the, for the Silicon guys. Look at the, look at the current Intel chip. Look at the scale of how big the die has grown for them to put in the things that we are asking them to do. So, you know, in terms of reducing our complexity, um, moving to the, the, the public cloud really aggressively is not going to reduce our complexity. It just, it, in fact, it will add to it, it will grow it, it will make it worse. However, and, and Raj makes a really good point. Is there an opportunity in, in, with the cloud guys in selling connectivity? Absolutely, we sell tons of it, and it's and it's there today. Right, and we have to remember that <coughs> what we're debating here is whether the public cloud is the simplest route to ra radical, radical transformation for the world's telco. So, so we, Chris, we've got some comeback, Chris, and then Alan. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, take an analogy with What's banking. It? You know, what's happening in banking? You can go to, on cloud instead of this what they call a neo bank, right? So you have a neo bank, you can quickly spin it up. Effectively, you have more mature industry cloud for finance, let's say. But if you think that traditional banks, the problem they're facing is that they have this simple, let's say, neo bank on cloud. But guess what? All the customers are in the old systems, right? They have a massive migration tasks, and they end up running two stacks, you know, to move them over. I'm not saying this is happening in telcos right now. But if you think of the analogy, like if everything was software, I didn't have the network, and I can do all of this sort of stuff on cloud, like telco in a box, or let's call it the neo telco. Uh, don't forget, all your customers are still, and all your products, and all the legacy yeah. is, is still. So, and you have to move it over, and that's a massive task. Right. Yeah. So, so Neil, I agree with you on this one. Last time I disagreed. This time I do agree. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to agree with you. Not today, I'm afraid. Um, but I disagree with Raj, um, and I'll explain uh, both of them. Uh, it took two years, two more than two years to port Waze from AWS to GCP after Google acquired Waze. But Two it, plus years. But what was the reason? Okay, API sets, API sets, right? So it is hard to, to once you get in, as Daniel was pointing out earlier, to actually move out. It is hard. Now, you get in for, e for the right reasons, and that's what Neil was pointing out. I think I totally agree, which means you actually get into a, a point where you're exploiting, I think that was a point you were making earlier, is that you're exploiting each cloud's strength to build a service. Now, the part that I disagree with you is cloud providers, I mean, sorry, service providers or telcos cannot be in connectivity business. Sorry, if they're in connectivity business, that's a losing proposition. They have to be in services business. They have to embrace it to build the right kind of services and capability. You cannot be just simply connecting clouds and saying, well, I can monetize these bits per second lines. Sorry, that's old school business. That's not what I mean. So le let me uh, respond to that, right? There are two I'm parts. Gonna, when we talk about multi-cloud, there's a misunderstanding. Nobody's talking about making applications portable to simply go from one cloud to another. That's very hard. 
all of us should agree to that, right? That's the uh, utopia people have tried to project uh, startups went and came out. I think enterprises are selectively deciding based on sovereign cloud, sovereign uh, GDPR, whatever reasons, some workloads to be based in some region or some public clouds, some workloads to be placed in another public cloud, creating the multi-cloud world. That's what I mean. I'm not talking about portability. Now, when I talk about connectivity as a service, I'm not talking about uh, bits per second, physical connectivity. When you look at inter-VPC connectivity, if you look at inter-region connectivity, if you look at inter-cloud connectivity you need, this is all so in software. It's all in software, but expertise is in carrier-grade networking with telcos that they can use to provide multi-cloud connectivity as a service from on-prem to multiple public clouds and use their regional networks to provide much better cost and quality of service and security compared to what public clouds are providing with AWS Direct Connect or GCP Connect and so on. That's what I mean. This is an opportunity to monetize completely new kinds of software service. That's what I was arguing about. Okay, fantastic. I'm just going to see if there's a, another question in the audience because we are uh, running out. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll come back to Danielle for the final point and then uh, we are down to two minutes. So yeah, And then yeah. we can come to the so vote. So I think, I think Neil brought this up in the first debate. I think you definitely need to start with your business case of understanding why you're moving to the cloud because I think a lot of people just start start doing some cloud stuff and they kind of lose lose track of the of the business reason for moving. You can do cloud really really badly. I mean, you can just start using it, spending a shit ton of money. Sorry, live, right? Just spending a lot of money and it gets away from you and you're moving stuff up. And so I think you really need to understand which workloads are you going to move. Um, have a architecture plan of how you're going to maximize the use of the public cloud. Um, I think it can be a drug dealer, a really, really awesome drug dealer that's helping you be more, <laughs> right? I think the big, big problem with telco is we move so slowly, we're not responsive to customers' needs, we're not building these digital experiences, and after the pandemic, people are used to being, order, being able to order whatever they want and appearing on their door the next day. And still with telco, we're kind of like, but our systems, Right? And so if we can use this technology in the right way and get addicted in the right way, I think it actually could be very, I don't think just by moving to the cloud you are going to transform magically. But if you learn how to use it the right way, I think it'd be a very powerful tool for telcos. Okay. Right. It's paddle time. <laughs> Guy. Paddle up time. To, up to you. Should we get a ping pong ball at lunch and we could have a little bit of a game? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I've, I've just had a message in from Beth Cohn, who's, who's watching this remotely, who says she completely agrees with the Roach Motel effect. Yes. <laughs> We're going to make something Once of this. Once you move in, you can't move out. <laughs> That's what she means. But, but also, who, who carries business cards anymore? That's the well, yeah. That's, very, there's a radical trend. Drug dealers, obviously. <laughs> very, very suspicious. Drug right, dealers. we are going to recap our motion. Public cloud is the simplest route to radical transformation for the world's telcos. Are you for the motion? Are you against the motion? For the motion, please raise your paddle with the green side forward, oh, against with it. the red. It. And raise your paddles now. <laughs> Well, I think I think uh, I think the Reds have it. Yes. Reds have it. Deep <laughs> 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 We got sound. Um, thanks very much, everyone. It is now lunchtime. Lunch is going to be served, I believe, through that doorway there. Um, we are back at officially 10 minutes past two for the next debate. But if you want to get in here at two o'clock, we do have a little video for you. So uh, that's it. Thanks very much. Get lunch because it's being served now. Thank you.